the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Unnatural Causes, Hosea Easton's Treatise. In recent episodes, we've been considering some pretty underappreciated and relatively unknown figures. Consider David Walker. Experts in African-American history certainly do appreciate and know about him, to the point that one encyclopedia entry on Walker begins by describing him as perhaps the most influential African-American author in the 19th century. And closer to his own time, no less a figure than Frederick Douglass said that Walker's appeal against slavery startled the land like a trump of coming judgment. Yet today, most people are much, much more likely to know about Douglass than Walker. And that goes double for Maria W. Stewart. She may have been the first American-born woman of any race to give public speeches, and as noted in the aforementioned encyclopedia, one of the first African-American women to consciously write about political matters. But Stewart is far from being well-known today. And unlike Walker, her significance was underrated even back in the 19th century. After her farewell speech in Boston and departure for New York in 1833, her bold efforts soon became mostly forgotten. In 1878, almost four decades after the death of her husband, a change in the law finally allowed her to collect her widow's pension. With the proceeds, she published her collected speeches and older writings, along with more recent autobiographical reflections. That was in 1879, the same year as her death. She went to the next world, still seeking to make her mark on this one. If Walker and Stewart are not well remembered, however, they are positively household names compared to Hosea Easton. Like them, he was active in the black community of Boston around the year 1830. Our focus in recent episodes on this city, by the way, is not because that's where I'm from. Well, okay, not only for that reason. Well, you might wonder, though, especially when you notice that the encyclopedia we mentioned gives Easton no entry at all, why is it that we are devoting a whole episode to this most obscure of my three fellow Bostonians? We can start answering that question by quoting Bruce Dane, one of the few scholars to pay serious attention to Easton. In his book, A Hideous Monster of the Mind, American Race Theory in the Early Republic, Dane confidently asserts that, with his 1837 treatise, Hosea Easton became the first African American to articulate a systematic theory of race. Dane is referring to the exploration of race and racism in Easton's most important work, his Treatise on the Intellectual Character and Civil and Political Condition of the Colored People of the United States and the Prejudice Exercised Toward Them. Dane's claim is pretty bold, given how strongly Walker, Stewart, and others before them had concerned themselves with the topic of racial difference. Indeed, we're not quite sure we would go along with Dane on this, but we do agree with him that Easton was an uncommonly systematic thinker, one who opposed slavery and racial discrimination with creative and challenging ideas and arguments about the nature of race and racial prejudice. Take Easton's consideration of whether prejudice against his people is caused by the physical difference of color as he thinks most people suppose. If so, we might pessimistically conclude that there is an insurmountable barrier to functional social and political relations between white and black Americans. After all, black people can hardly change the color of their skins. Easton argues against this common assumption in two steps, invoking abstract laws concerning the nature of things. The first law is, as he puts it, that effects partake of their parent cause in nature and quantity. In other words, more intense causes produce stronger effects. In the case of skin color, if it were the cause of racial prejudice, we should see a tight correspondence between darker skin and more intense prejudice. Easton denies, however, that this is how American racism works. Even being as white in appearance as someone of European ancestry, or whiter still, is no protection from prejudice as intense as that suffered by those with the darkest skin. All that matters is recent African ancestry. His second law is that that which cannot be contemplated as a principle abstractly cannot be an efficient cause of anything. Easton's idea here is that there are active principles, which are real causes, and passive principles, which depend on active principles for their existence and thus are only imagined to be causes. Active principles, Easton argues, must possess a power of activity independent of bodies that live, die, and decompose. Skin color is not independent in this way, and thus can only be an imaginary cause of prejudice. We may usefully recognize it as, in his words, a trait by which a principle is identified, but we must go beyond this surface-level identification 
this literally skin-deep veneer, in order to recognize the true principle of which it is but a mere sign. Having thus objected in these two ways to the idea of skin color as the cause of prejudice, he clarifies that slavery is the real cause. Slavery efficiently causes prejudice that can equally victimize people regardless of how dark their skin is, and slavery acts in a manner independent of the body. It's easy to think of objections to Easton's argument, starting with his empirical claim about skin color. Is it really true that darker skin does not provoke greater prejudice? It may seem to do so today, though we should bear in mind that in Easton's time, lighter skin was no shield against being enslaved. Then also, why exactly can't that which dies and decomposes be an active principle? Perhaps he has in mind something like this. If you punch a wall, it's not the wall that causes the punching, and not even your fist, but your soul, which commanded your fist to move. Not a claim that all would endorse, but plenty of philosophers throughout history have done so. In any case, Easton's effort here toward systematic argument shows how he founded a plausible cultural claim that slavery rather than skin color is the ultimate foundation of racial prejudice against African Americans on philosophical principles. It seems that historians of Africana philosophy can find in Easton a rich and barely touched resource. Easton was born in 1798 in what is today Brockton, Massachusetts, south of Boston. He was the seventh and last child of James and Sarah Easton, both of whom were, like their children, born free. Indeed, Easton mentions in his treatise that he is of the third generation from slave parents, possibly suggesting that not only both of his parents, but all of his grandparents were born free. Historians take his father, James Easton, to be descended from slaves emancipated by Quakers in the late 17th century. Like the similarly named James Fortin, whom we have discussed in past episodes, James Easton served the colonial cause during the Revolutionary War and managed afterward to achieve a noteworthy measure of financial success. The elder Easton worked as a blacksmith, but grew his business to the point where he would be more appropriately called a general contractor for a construction company. He was well respected and friendly with other important people of the time and place, like Paul Cuffey. From his parents, young Hosea Easton learned powerful lessons about challenging racism and uplifting the black community. First of all, the Easton family has the remarkable distinction of having engaged in the first recorded sit-ins in American history. Sometime before Hosea was born, the church they attended installed a porch for the seating of black attendants, thus segregating the congregation. The Eastons refused to sit there, and had to be physically removed from their seating in the white section of the church. Later, when Hosea was a child, the family purchased a pew in a different church. When racist parishioners poured tar on it, the Eastons responded by bringing their own seats. Prevented from setting these up, they sat in the aisle. They kept this up until they were formally expelled from the church. One can only imagine the deep impact that being part of this dramatic protest had on the young Hosea. And we don't have to imagine the impact of another event on Hosea, as it is discussed in his treatise. The elder Easton decided sometime around the end of the first decade of the 19th century to turn his factory for ironworking into a school focused on manual labor. In addition to smithing, student laborers attending the school learned farming, shoemaking, reading, writing, and arithmetic. It was a visionary approach to black education coming long before similar efforts later on in the century. James poured time and money into the school while Hosea and his brothers were among those who learned there. Over the two decades that it existed, however, this effort was actively opposed by many white community members. It closed for good not long before James Easton's death in 1830. Here is how his son writes about it in the treatise. By reason of the repeated surges of the tide of prejudice, the establishment, like a ship in a boisterous hurricane at sea, went beneath its waves, richly laden, well-manned, and well-managed, and all sunk to rise no more. Embittered by this experience, Easton gradually turned his attention from manual labor to ministry and social activism over the course of the 1820s. With his wife Louisa, he moved to Boston, and while preparing for ministry became a prominent community member. He was, for example, involved in the Massachusetts General Colored Association, one of multiple ways he came into contact with Walker. As another example of their connection, in March of 1828, Easton chaired a meeting in support of the newspaper Freedom's Journal, at which Walker spoke. Easton himself soon proved to be a public speaker in demand. In November of 1828, he traveled to Providence, Rhode Island to deliver a Thanksgiving Day address to the black community of that city. He had not intended to publish the speech, but was prevailed upon to do so, 
and so, aside from the treatise, it is the main document preserving his thought. The speech contributes to our sense that something special was happening in the intellectual world of Black Boston in the late 1820s. It's remarkably easy to connect parts of the speech to the works of Walker and Stewart. In structure, though, it foreshadows a later speech, one of the most famous given by a Black American of the 19th century, Frederick Douglass's The Meaning of July 4th for the Negro, which we will explore in depth in a coming episode. As Douglas would later do, Easton began by evoking with apparent sympathy the patriotism many Americans feel on the occasion of the holiday being celebrated. In this case, the holiday is Thanksgiving, a time for Americans to be grateful to God for rearing us from nothing to a great and mighty nation. But he then switches to a passionate denunciation of slavery and discrimination, which make it impossible for African Americans to feel the same gratefulness for the expanded wings of liberty. Easton dwells on the unfreedom of African Americans in a manner reminiscent of Walker's argument against Thomas Jefferson that African Americans have been rendered the most wretched beings in human history through the closure of every door of opportunity and the added indignity of being blamed as the cause of this exclusion. Speaking of free black people striving to better themselves through entrepreneurship, Easton says, Let the man of business travel through the northern states, and I am ready to prove to you that he will not pass ten miles without meeting with insults almost sufficient to enrage a saint. If he hires his passage in the stage, he must be posted up with the driver to suffer the severity of the weather. When the passengers stop to dine, he must take his fare in the cook room with the cook. If you look for his lodging chamber, you will find it in the garret or back clutter chamber. These are fine places for men of business. Under these and other disadvantages, we see the man is not calculated to do business for the want of society. And, to discourage and depress his mind still further, the question is asked by the whites, why is it that Negroes cannot do business like other people? When Easton moves to conclude his speech, though, there is yet another switch. He suggests to his black audience that they should after all be thankful for rays of rational intelligence and literary acquirements that are beginning to break through the darkness which has so long pervaded the minds of this population. He does not recommend simply taking comfort in these positive signs, however, advocating instead precisely the kind of exertion central to Stewart's message in her speeches. It is evident that we ought to turn our attention to moral improvement. A principle of jealousy, one towards another, has become almost hereditary, which prevents any combined operation among us. The first thing necessary is to cultivate the principles of concord and unanimity among ourselves that we may become aids to each other. Like Stewart, Easton declines to advocate violent resistance, and suggests instead that the way forward lies in the unification of the black community as they strive to improve their minds and behavior. Despite the similarities, and despite the fact that we know Easton was in contact with Walker and probably with Stewart, it would be questionable to treat these similarities as evidence of actual influence of those two thinkers on Easton. This 1828 speech precedes the publication of Walker's appeal in 1829 and Stewart's writings and speeches of the early 1830s. So, we might instead wonder whether Easton influenced Walker and Stewart as opposed to the other way around. It's perhaps safest to speak vaguely of ideas that were in the air at the time. It is fascinating, however, that when we turn to his treatise, which did come after Walker's appeal and Stewart's productions, we see a sharp contrast between Easton and these other two, which may be a matter of this philosophical mind trying to work out tensions that arise from the lines of thought we have associated with Walker and Stewart. Easton spends much of the Thanksgiving Day speech depicting American oppression as an almost inescapably soul-crushing system, in the way Walker does. But then, he ends on a surprisingly optimistic note by suggesting, like Stewart, that black people should trust in the power of self-improvement. As we noted when discussing Stewart, her thoughts on self-improvement certainly built on Walker's strategy of disproving white racism through black accomplishment. But at times, the focus on what black people can achieve if they put their minds to it leads her to relegate systematic prejudice to the background. Given all that we have said about the similarities between these three thinkers, this tension between recognizing the barriers to black progress and upholding black people as masters of their own fate perhaps runs through all of their works, but it is arguably at its most palpable in Easton's Thanksgiving speech. But before we address the resolution of this tension in the treatise, let's catch up with Easton during the decade or so separating the speech in Providence and his 1837 masterwork. In 1831, he traveled to Philadelphia as one of four delegates from Massachusetts 
to attend a meeting billed as the first annual convention of free people of color. Not to be pedantic, but there had actually been another such meeting already in the previous year. It was presided over by Richard Allen, who died just months later. But this second 1831 meeting nevertheless more clearly launched a series of so-called colored conventions, which throughout the antebellum period and even afterward would serve as feats of organized activism and also as important spaces for the expression of ideas. Easton served as chaplain at subsequent conventions and is recorded as proposing and seconding motions, attending each year until 1834. The movement temporarily died out after 1835, but as we will see in a coming episode on Henry Highland Garnet, dramatically reignited in 1843. In 1833, Easton and his family moved to Hartford, Connecticut, where he pastored two churches in succession before his untimely death in July of 1837, only a few months after publishing his treatise. His experience in Hartford was a trying one. White racists harassed black people in the city, and Easton's own parishioners were sometimes physically attacked. As if that weren't enough, after Easton founded and began to pastor his second church, it burned to the ground. It was during this time of hardship that Easton wrote his treatise, and seemingly other works as well, as the final page of the treatise promises the coming publication of Easton's Lectures on Civil, Social, and Moral Economy. That work, if it was completed, is unfortunately lost, but its title is indicative of Easton's investment in developing a comprehensive moral and political philosophy. His view seems to have been that when the going gets tough, the tough get theoretical. When you start reading the treatise, you might underestimate the originality of what is to come. Central to the introduction is an attempt to investigate national difference of intellect by comparing the history of Europe and Africa. In making this comparison, Easton turns to ancient Egypt and glorifies not only its accomplishments, but the way its advances were shared with others, such as the Greeks. So far, so familiar from Walker and Stewart. Walker, for example, spoke of the importance of taking a retrospective view of the arts and sciences, the wise legislators, the pyramids and other magnificent buildings, the turning of the channel of the River Nile by the sons of Africa or of Ham, among whom learning originated and was carried thence into Greece. But Easton goes into the subject in greater depth. He constructs, to the best of his ability, a chronology of Egypt from its foundation all the way to the period of Muslim rule, and contrasts its history to that of Europe from ancient times to the age of exploration and colonization. Europe's history he depicts as one of war and brutality, and if it is widely supposed that Europeans advanced arts and sciences more than Africans did, this is due partly to the erasure of African history through imperialistic destruction. Powerful anti-Eurocentric stuff, but one would still assume that his point is to encourage pride in African Americans as modern-day sons and daughters of Africa. Certainly, that's the sense we get from Walker and Stewart. It is striking, in fact, that Walker and Stewart generally use the term Americans to refer to the white people of the United States, while they refer to their people simply as Africans. The irony of this is strongest when they are attacking the American Colonization Society and the idea of going to Liberia. Right after vowing that she will be pierced by the bayonet rather than be driven to a strange land, Stewart closes her speech at the African Masonic Hall with the same sentence she used to open it, African rights and liberty is a subject that ought to fire the breast of every free man of color in these United States and excite in his bosom a lively, deep, decided, and heartfelt interest. Thus, Stewart can speak of Africa as a strange land while accepting in the next breath that the most sensible way to refer to her own people in the United States is as Africans. Easton sharply breaks with this pattern. The first chapter of the treatise repudiates any close connection between ancient Egypt, or Africa in general, and the people in the United States with which he identifies. In this country we behold the remnant of a once noble but now heathenish people. In calling the attention of my readers to the subject which I here present them, I would have them lose sight of the African character about which I have made some remarks in my introduction. For at this time circumstances have established as much difference between them and their ancestry as exists between them and any other race or nation. In the first place, the colored people who are born in this country are Americans, in every sense of the word, Americans by birth, genius, habits, language, etc. This difference between Easton and his fellow Bostonian thinkers is not trivial. Without yet explaining its full practical significance, Easton here relinquishes any share for African Americans in the glory he attributed to Egypt, 
thus rejecting a key component of the strategy for encouraging self-improvement we find in Walker and Stewart. But why bother with an Afrocentric account of ancient Egypt's greatness if this is irrelevant to the character and potential of African Americans? The reason is that, in the introduction, his goal was to clear away the myth of inherent white superiority. He opened the introduction by assuming as given the biblical claim that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Just as some species of flower come in varying colors, so do human beings. This is the result of the desire for variety that impels nature, which is a principle of activity that Easton treats as created and empowered by God, not as identical to him. But while nature has the power to produce such physical variation, Easton says he cannot believe that nature has anything to do in variegating intellect. A fundamental feature of the nature of things, in his view, is that mind can act on matter, but matter cannot act upon mind. Remember again his insistence that only things independent from bodies are active causes. So nature, whose domain of activity is matter, does not produce variation in intellect. But we cannot attribute this variation to God either, because God's works are perfect and do not vary from superior to inferior. This means that human intellect, as initially created by God, admitted of no variation in quality. It is the fall from grace that produced intellectual variation. Easton's glorification of ancient Egypt illustrates this point. It proves that the myth of white superiority is just that, a myth, as Africans can achieve and display intellectual attainments, matching and exceeding those attained by Europeans. But having established that in the introduction, he has other fish to fry in the first chapter. He admits real, non-mythical inferiority among African Americans, which he believes to result from the evil of slavery. This is undoubtedly the most controversial aspect of the treatise, and possibly an aspect of the book that was unappealing to readers, which may help explain its obscurity. Easton affirms the intellectual and physical inferiority of the slave population. With respect to physical features, he recapitulates descriptions by white authors of contracted and sloped foreheads, prominent eyeballs, projecting underjaw, certain distended muscles about the mouth or lower parts of the face, thick lips and fat nose, hips and rump projecting, crooked shins, flat feet with large projecting heels. He accepts both this and descriptions of intellectual inferiority, but calls it bad grace to speak so derisively of deformities that originate in the acts of white people themselves. It is not Easton's intention to disparage black people as a race. Indeed, part of his point is that the intellectual and physical inferiority of the slave population can be accounted for without imputing it to an original hereditary cause, as white racists do. He turns to the biology of pregnancy to reveal just how powerful the ill effects of slavery are. Easton compares the emotional support and nutritious food required for healthy pregnancy with the sights, sounds, and sufferings experienced by an enslaved pregnant woman, concluding that it is impossible to avoid the consequence of deficiencies in the children born from such pregnancies. Once again, raising his argument to the level of metaphysical generality, he writes, If we are permitted to decide that natural causes produce natural effects, then it must be equally true that unnatural causes produce unnatural effects. The slave system is an unnatural cause, and has produced its unnatural effects, as displayed in the deformity of two and a half millions of beings, who have been under its soul and body-destroying influence lineally for near 300 years. Over the course of the book's remaining three chapters, Easton elaborates a theory of the relationship between legal and political structures, on the one hand, and what he calls public sentiment, on the other hand. Public sentiment, as he explains in the introduction, is founded on the real or imaginary interests of parties, whose individual interests are identified one with another. When these individuals identifying with each other's interests have high ideals, societies are improved. Though when public sentiment is corrupted by greed and malice, no legal and political structure can withstand the pernicious effects. As he puts it, good laws and a good form of government are of but very little use to a wicked people. In fact, he holds that the perversion of infinite good is infinite evil, and thus that the better the form of government, the worse the results when public sentiment is corrupted. Thus, the republicanism of the United States is no blessing while slavery rules through public sentiment. We've already explored his argument for slavery as the root of prejudice, but we should add a further point, namely his distinction between malignant prejudice and forms that are harmless, or which are harmful but rooted in mistaken belief or ignorance, rather than ill will. 
Anti-Irish prejudice, for instance, is rooted in different manners and religion, so as not to be malignant, because it easily fades in the wake of Irish assimilation. Prejudice against Native Americans, by contrast, is malignant, but Easton claims it only rears its ugly head when they show signs of national life, and thus threaten to recover their rightful possessions. Anti-Black prejudice is something worse, a persistent attitude targeting a people who have lost their homeland beyond possible recovery and are not allowed to become American through assimilation. There is much of philosophical interest throughout these discussions, from the philosophy of language involved in Easton's analysis of how the N-word operates as a slur, to the way he views mind as acting on matter when prejudice leads bright young people toward an early grave. But where does all this lead him in terms of the question of a practical solution? Remember the tension in his Thanksgiving Day speech with its hopeful preaching of self-improvement in the face of systematic oppression and exclusion. In the treatise, Easton radically departs from Walker and Stewart by refusing to lay any responsibility on African Americans themselves. He advocates neither violent resistance nor uplift through increasing knowledge and better behavior. The inferiority inculcated through the practice of slavery can and must be reversed, and there is only one way to do it. White Americans must pursue immediate emancipation and then subsequently commit to ongoing efforts at repair. All the elements of his view as expressed in what has come before join together in this proposal of the concluding fourth chapter. He emphasizes once again that black Americans are Americans, not Africans. In fact, he even claims that there is not a drop of African blood flowing in the veins of an American-born child, though black as jet. His argument is that even for the slave born in Africa, exposure to the food, climate, and surroundings of America has an effect that changes the body. By the time we are speaking of children born in America, it is meaningless in his view to say they are African by blood. As Americans in every sense of the term, these people clearly merit every right and opportunity available to other Americans. But what about the idea that the slaves are not immediately fit for freedom, thus requiring a gradual process that will prepare them for that higher state? This is nonsense on Easton's view, even though he has of course admitted the debilitating effects of slavery on the minds and bodies of the enslaved. In fact, he tells the story of visiting New York and hearing of how those set free by the more recent emancipation of slaves in that state are terribly lazy and self-indulgent. This is to be expected, according to Easton, because a slave is metamorphosed into a machine adapted to a specific operation and propelled by the despotic power of the slave system, which means that when the principles of slavery ceases to act upon him to the end for which he is a slave, he is left a mere out-of-use wreck of machinery. This debilitation, however, cannot serve as justification for gradual emancipation because continued slavery is continued debilitation. What this debilitation justifies instead is another claim made by Easton, one that makes him unique among abolitionist thinkers, that emancipation is insufficient for bringing about the end of slavery. For Easton, emancipation embraces the idea that the emancipated must be placed back where slavery found them and restore to them all that slavery has taken away from them. This is, of course, for Easton, not the claim that the emancipated must be returned to Africa, but rather that the emancipated must be helped toward that fullness of humanity that slavery systematically destroyed. He's not very specific about the measures that are needed, but we can imagine that support for projects like his father's school would qualify. Philanthropic efforts of this kind will have physical effects. The countenance which has been cast down hitherto would brighten up with joy. Their narrow foreheads, which have hitherto been contracted for the want of mental exercise, would begin to broaden. Their eyeballs, hitherto strained out to prominence by a frenzy excited by the flourish of the whip, would fall back under a thick foliage of curly eyebrows indicative of deep, penetrating thought. Easton's unique vision was generally overlooked, as we've already noted. Part of the reason is that he had little opportunity to promote the book and revise it for further editions because of his death just a few months after its publication. George R. Price and James Brewer Stewart, who have done the most to bring Easton to current scholarly attention, speculate that another reason for the fate of the treatise is a change in leadership. Whereas a majority of the leaders we've described in recent episodes have been people born free, as the 19th century wore on, leaders like Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and Sojourner Truth emerged, and these were former slaves. It is likely, Price and Stewart suggest, that Easton's acceptance of descriptions of the enslaved as inferior one little sympathy in light of this development.
Still, one abolitionist leader of the middle of the 19th century remembered Easton fondly. William Cooper Nell was the son of William G. Cooper, yet another figure from Boston, what can I say, it's an amazing city, who participated in the Massachusetts General Colored Association alongside Easton and Walker. In an 1855 book called The Colored Patriots of the American Revolution, a pioneering work of history by a black author, Nell mentioned James Easton as a veteran of the Revolutionary War. With respect to James' son, Nell wrote, Hosea Easton published a treatise on the intellectual condition of the colored people in which was shown the heart of a philanthropist and the head of a philosopher. Soon we'll be turning to a more famous man whose writings made him both the head and the heart of the abolitionist movement. We've mentioned him several times in this episode, Frederick Douglass. But before we meet him, we want to look back over the significance of earlier 19th century Africana thought. For that purpose, we'll be hearing from an expert on this period and African-American political thought more generally, Melvin Rogers. He's from New York, but don't let that stop you from joining us and him on the next episode of The History of Africana Philosophy. I'm gonna tell God all of my troubles